Amen. Well, good morning to you. It's great seeing you. I've been looking forward to coming. I uh, uh, have enjoyed being out here uh, again with Truman. Came in yesterday, and Jim, and and Nick, and and uh, the wives. Except for Jim's wives, there's a grandbaby. I think that uh, kind of took a little precedence, which I can fully understand. But uh, it's great being here with Bacon Heights. I uh, kind of have a a history with your church, uh, just in a roundabout way. My dad uh, was pastor in Seagraves when I was just a little bitty short, bald, fat boy. Now I grew up to be a tall, fat man, bald. But uh, uh, grew up uh, in, uh, spent a few years in Seagraves, but it was at the same time that, that Hank Scott was the pastor at First Baptist in Seagraves whenever my father was at Temple Baptist. So I knew your founding pastor and and his family and uh, for years. And then being around this area, we went from Seagraves to Kermit and then from Kermit to Abilene. I call Abilene home just because I went through junior high and high school and college there. But, uh, but uh, really loved being here. I, I, I kind of grew up on the Tech campus when I was a little preschooler. My dad would take uh, classes when he was pastor in Seagraves. He'd take classes at Tech and it, uh, a lot of times be on a Saturday uh, morning, he'd take some classes and I'd get to come up with him and sit in the ch- uh, student center and watch cartoons on the TV while he went to class and then we'd go to the Raider game. And uh, so I've uh, been a Raider fan for many years and uh, I married a Tennessee Vols fan though. So, uh, so uh, we, uh, you know, kind of have some difficulties at times, you know, but uh, then our daughter went to TCU and then I worked for BGCT and have, of course, Baylor. And so yesterday was really a, a heartache. I had to get out of town. I couldn't handle that uh, going on at home. But, uh, but anyway, it's great, uh, it's great being we. And I, I'm sorry, but boy, I tell you, that was a crushing blow yesterday. Uh, I, 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 I dislike West Virginia even more than I ever have. So uh, that's just another story. If you have your Bibles, I trust you do. Open them to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're looking at a familiar story today. It's uh, one that we've read many times, studied. Uh, We're familiar with it. It's about Jesus going through a place that was actually his headquarters in the northern Galilee area when he had his northern uh, portion of his earthly ministry. Jesus uh, settled himself in. It's uh, just about a two-day walk from Nazareth where Jesus grew up going over to Capernaum. And uh, it was there at Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus Uh, lived in the same house, if you will, with uh, the Apostle Peter, one of his disciples, uh, Peter and his wife. We know Peter was married because Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law at one point. You can't have a mother-in-law unless you have a wife. So, uh, So we know that they all lived in the same household. And in this particular story, in Mark chapter 2, it's a very, very unusual thing happened. Jesus had been out. He had been speaking and preaching and doing miracles. He came back. In fact, the Bible says that he came back home. They heard that he had come back home. Uh, and, and we all know that his home was Nazareth, two days walk over. But, uh, but Jesus uh, was living in that, in that uh, little town and living in the home with Peter. And uh, it was, he'd been there long enough now to where he was considered a homeboy. He was a homebody there in Capernaum. And the people in the little community there came in and they had heard that Jesus came back home. They wanted a miracle to happen. They wanted to hear his teaching. And so as you read through those first few verses of Mark chapter 2, you find that, that Jesus had come into the house uh, where Peter, uh, Peter's home was, where he lived, and the people had gathered in and they had crowded in as best they could. And there was not any room left for any of them. And so they were standing outside. They were all over the place. And then there were, there were uh, some friends of a paralytic. And they saw a need that needed to be met, and they brought this paralytic friend on a mat, brought him up to the house, too many people to crowd in the door, too many people inside to get him in there. And so what did they do? They went up on top of the house. Now, if you've ever traveled in, in the Holy Land and been in Capernaum, and, and I've been there 27 times, and going there to Capernaum, it's a wonderful place where you can see the actual, I believe, the very place where this story occurs. It's, uh, it's, it's there. Uh, you can look down into it. You can see, you can see this, uh, this is a very holy place. They had preserved it 
for uh, all of these many centuries and uh, as the place where this miracle occurred. And I try to imagine if you see the, if you know how they do the construction, you know, they call Jesus a carpenter. It was really more of a, uh, of a stone mason. Uh, a carpenter of that day, yes, they would make, they would make uh, chairs and tables and woodwork inside the house for furnishings, but carpenters of the day were really working stone a lot. Uh, he, he, uh, he was, uh, he and, and his, uh, uh, and Joseph, uh, as he grew up in the household, uh, were, uh, building homes. They were, he was a contractor and all the homes were built out of these stones. And, and, and as you build these stones, uh, homes, you, uh, you, you oftentimes, and really most of the time they would have this stairway on the outside and you could go up to the roof. The roof was like having another room. They didn't have a central air. It would get hot during certain times of the year, and they could go out, and sometimes they would even sleep on the roof. Sometimes they would, uh, you know, just spend the evening there in, uh, in the nice sunset and the cool breeze because it was hot inside the home sometimes. And so uh, it was a very common type of uh, area where you could go up. Now, well, the way they would do it is they would put these beams across and then they would put all of these branches and then pack it in with mud and then put cross beams across that and put in some more branches and leaves and then pack it in with mud and almost a concrete ceiling uh, where they could have enough, uh, uh, it would bear enough weight and sometimes it would be as much as 24 to 36 inches thick. Uh, of, of almost a concrete uh, hardness with these beams in, in between it. <coughs> now that's what, <coughs> excuse me, that's what we find where these men took the man on the pallet, went in, could not get inside the house, go up on the roof, and they start ripping the top of the roof out. They lowered the man in, they built, they had to make a big enough uh, uh, opening so that they could lower the mat all the way down inside there in front of Jesus. And the Bible says, are you looking at the story in, Luke, in, in Mark chapter 2? The Bible says that Jesus, when he saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. What an incredible story. Here's a great miracle worker, a great teacher, a great rabbi, one who brings salvation, one who preached repentance, one who is the God incarnate, one who is born of a virgin, who is born of a virgin, one who is, is God himself living a sinless perfect life, and one who sees their faith, your sins are forgiven. I want to ask you a question today. What difference do you make in this world? Do you really make a difference? <laughs> I mean, do we just kind of live this life? We're born all by accident. It's what science tries to tell us. We're all born by accident. We just kind of go along a routine. We try to pick out a pathway. We get to the end. We all die, and it's all over with. What difference do we really make? Is there really anything in it for us and about us? Well, I think we can glean a lot, of, uh, a lot from this passage. In fact, I came up with about 15 different points that I want to share with you. <laughs> Y'all going to be here to about three? <laughs> I culled through, and I got two things I want to tell you from this story <laughs> before we're done here in the next few minutes. And that is you make a lot of difference. You make all the difference in the world when it comes to being a Christ follower. Some of us are worried about where this state of the world is today. Some of us are concerned about... Uh, Ebola, ISIS, uh, there's terror going on all around the world. There, there are, you know, where's Christianity in the midst of all of this? Is Christianity even true uh, compared to any other kind of uh, faith-based uh, uh, religion that, that uh, so many people, we're, we're seeing all this. Can I tell you some, uh, some, tr some truths? That is, Christianity is flourishing today more than it ever has in its 2,000-year history. There are more people coming to belief in fellowship of Christ today in China or in India or in other places than there have been in the history of, this, uh, of the church in the last 2,000 years. 
Christianity is flourishing like you would never believe. There are Muslims that are coming to Christ, and some of them have never even had the opportunity to have a missionary in their home or in their community because it's against the law. And the Christian that might be there would be beheaded or something would take place. But God is appearing. There, there, you can go on the website. You can go on the Internet, and you can see Muslims are putting their testimonies in that they have become followers of Christ. And the way it all started was they had a vision of Isis, of Christ, Jesus. And God is drawing them to himself. It's unbelievable what's happening in the world that God is taking care of. And it's because people like you and me, people who would commit our lives to following Jesus Christ, we can make a difference and we are making a difference. We might not see it. We might not understand it. We may not know how it is happening, but God is doing it today in this world. And you're in a position to where you can be a part of that. There was a guy by the name of Ed Lorenz. He was a meteorologist, a weather scientist. And in 1963, he stood before the uh, New York Academy of Science giving a presentation, presenting a hypothesis that had never been presented before. When he stood before that room full of, a, of, uh, of, of scientists, many of them uh, physics professors, some of them meteorologists, all of them scientists in some capacity or another. He led to Wren, stood before them and presented a hypothesis that he called, he, he, he didn't call it the butterfly effect, but he did say in the midst of his hypothesis that because of what maybe a butterfly could do in South America in flapping its wings, that the air molecules could be stirred with just the flapping of a butterfly's wings. His theory was that it could, con it could condition itself to, to uh, connect with additional air molecules and begin to spread almost like dropping a, a pebble in a pond and seeing the rippling effect, that that same thing could happen and that it could result on the other side of the ocean, on the coastlines of Africa, into a hurricane. Well, all the scientists just laughed him out. That's the, that, that hypothesis, there's no way to prove it, number one. Number two, it's a ridiculous thought. What a theory. Well, science fiction writers picked it up in the 1960s and 1970s, and so we started, they're the ones that named it the butterfly effect. They're the ones that started calling it this butterfly effect that maybe the wings of a butterfly could stir up air molecules to turn into a hurricane uh, from South America to Africa. And so we read a lot about it in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, but it wasn't from scientists. It was from novel writers and, and, and science fiction writers. Until in recent years, physics professors have come together and said there is provable a law of physics. And it's called the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. Think about it. Sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. There is a law of physics that is that. It might affect weather. It, we certainly know it's part of the chaos theory that has been prevalent over the last 10 or 15 years, that there can be something that would, be, that would happen over here and there is a, an initial condition and it would have a sensitive dependence upon a greater condition that can happen over here. Well, if they had just asked me 30 years ago, I would have told them. The Bible says there is a law of sensitive dependence upon initial condition, and that is you and me doing something and following Christ can have a lifetime effect and an impact upon the world because it's gone on for 2,000 years. Christ came, died on a cross to take our sin away, rose again from the dead, conquered death, provided for us grace, and gave us an opportunity to come into a loving, living, ruling, reigning relationship with Him. All because He created us for a relationship, and He loves us that much. He doesn't need us. He just loves us. He just wants us. He created us for that kind of fellowship. And that, <clears throat> just that initial condition of the cross can result as a sensitive dependence upon me coming to know Him. In fact, I did that right down here at First Baptist Church Seminole. Came to know Christ as an eight-year-old boy. When I received Jesus as my Savior as an eight-year-old boy, 
My dad took us. He was pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Seagraves. We went over to First Baptist Seminole to hear Angel Martinez, the evangelist, preach, preach a revival. Don't know what he said. Eight-year-old, what, what do I know about coming in believer, as a believer in Christ? I just knew it was hot dog supper night, and, you know, I enjoyed the hot dogs. But there was a sense within me, a, 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 a pricking of the conscience, a pull from God that drew me to a time of saying, I'm going to give my life to him. And I prayed and asked Christ in my heart. I committed my life as best an eight-year-old boy could understand and do. When I did that, I have to confess to you that I opened one eye and I saw my sister, my older sister, doing the very same thing. And I have to, I have to say, my first thought as a brand new, newborn Christian, it wasn't, look at that, my sister's becoming a Christian the same time I am. My first thought was, I'm not in heaven yet. <laughs> Maybe I thought I watched way too much the old Star Trek. I thought maybe God was just going to go ahead and beam me on up. Get me, I mean, I've got six sisters. My dad's a Baptist preacher. We lived in Parsonage. They would have three bedrooms, a master bedroom, and then two others, and three and three of the girls. And then I'd get the utility closet, or I'd get the, you know, the pop-up camper out in the backyard. I mean, wherever I could find a place to sleep, that was my bedroom. I was 12 years old before I saw the inside of a bathroom with six sisters. (laughs) I was ready to go to heaven. Get me out of this place. I don't want to be here anymore. Even as much as I love West Texas, beam me on up, get me gone. But I became a Christian and God left me here. And those of you who are in this room that do, that do follow Christ and you are a believer and you know you've had that transforming work of His grace in your life, He left you here. But can I tell you something? He left you here because of a sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. He intends you to be the initial condition for there to be a sensitive dependence for others to be a follower. He's using you for his evangelism missions plan. That's why the church is here. The only reason, listen to me, the only reason the church, you and I, the people, not the building, the people, the only reason the church is still on this earth is because there are lost people still on this earth. That's it. Because we, we as followers of Christ have a place already prepared for us. This land is not our home. We're just passing through. But God leaves us here. Why? Because we are in a position to where there is God over here brings salvation and there is a need of those who don't have a relationship with him and he puts us right here in the middle. Point number one, get yourself in the position that God has put you and that is in the middle. And the middle is an awkward, uncomfortable position. Nobody likes the middle. Have you ever flown in an airplane and been in the middle seat? How many of you have ever gone on when you bought your ticket and you looked to see, I want to find a middle seat. That's the one that I'm going to select, and that's the one I'm going to fly on. If you did, I want to talk to you. you got some problems. I know a couple of counselors. I always look for an aisle or a window. I don't want the middle seat. It's just too crowded. Maybe, Maybe it's because I'm just, you know, I take up too much room. I don't know. But I can tell you that last spring I was on my way to Bangkok, Thailand, because I was there to do, I was uh, invited to come and do some, a week of training with some professors from the Bible schools all over the Southeast Asia. All of them gathering about 68 different uh, professors and presidents of those, uh, of those Bible schools all over Southeast Asia. I was headed over there and I flew from DFW to, uh, to, to, to Tokyo on American Airlines. And I'm American airline, mile, almost a million miler, and traveled a lot around the world, and, and uh, just logged my ticket on. But what I forgot to do was, knowing full well that I was going to change carriers at Tokyo to go to Bangkok, I did not go online to get onto the other carrier, Cathay Pacific, and be sure to pick out an aisle seat like I like. I don't, I'd, rather, I'd rather people climb over me rather than me climbing over them. And when you get my age... Sometimes you need to get up a little more often than the other people that are around you. Some of you will get that later. But, <clears throat> but uh, I forgot to do that. And I was in flight already on the way to Tokyo and knowing full well that I never did go on and pick a seat of my preference. 
and knowing full well most likely what was going to happen was I was going to have a middle seat assigned to me and sure enough get off one plane go to the next terminal get onto the Cathay Pacific plane and I'm right in the middle of the middle there's some seats over here on the side and then there's an aisle and then there's five seats in the middle and I'm in the very middle of the middle I got on early but before the plane all you know got fully loaded but I'm sitting there and I <laughs> You know, well, maybe, maybe I'm supposed to be here. I don't know. I had my Bible open in front of me. The reason I did was because I'd had a, uh, I, I'd, I'd had a wager, if you will, almost a, a, a dare from my nephew who a few weeks earlier had been to a camp. He memorized First Peter, the entire book, in one week, and then he quoted it all in one, at the end of that, uh, all in one setting at the end of that week. And I told him I was real proud of him for doing that, and he said, I bet you can't do that, Uncle Wayne. And I was going to be gone a week. I decided, well, I'm going to memorize 1 Peter, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to quote it to him. My problem is, with the way my mind works, I get to chapter 3, and I forget what I memorized in chapter 1. I had to start all over again. But I was sitting there with my Bible open on the tray while the plane was loading, and there was a young lady that sat down beside me. A young man sat over here beside me, and he was talking to another fellow beside him and across the aisle also, and they were all from Germany. They were speaking in German. I understood enough to know that uh, they were talking about a business that, that, w that they worked with that was out of Frankfurt, and they were, they were uh, on a business trip. The young lady had, a, uh, had a, uh, a uniform on that was like the flight attendants that were on that plane, but she was off duty. I did engage her in conversation, or she engaged me in conversation as we got up in the air. Had about a uh, seven-hour flight from Tokyo to Bangkok, and she, she was saying that her grandfather had passed away, he was uh, in Chiang Mai, and she was going to Bangkok, catch another flight, and go up to Chiang Mai, Thailand, and they were having a family funeral. She also been, began describing some of what that funeral was going to involve, and I don't know much about Buddhist funerals, but I learned a whole lot about Buddhist funerals. And so I asked her the question. I said, are you a Buddhist by culture, or are you a Buddhist by conviction? Because I grew up in West Texas. I grew up around people in the United States. Have you ever noticed when people travel from the United States and other countries? If they're from any other state besides Texas, they'll always say, I'm from the United States. If they're from Texas, they'll always say, I'm from Texas. You ever notice that? So I told her, I said, I'm from Texas. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she knew that was in the United States. And, and, uh, and, and I, I said, I know, I've known a lot of people through the years, and, and I would tell you that there's a great number that call themselves Christian that are more Christian by, by culture than they are by conviction. They, I even pastored a bunch of them. They're all over the place in West Texas and every place. And I said, are you that? Are you more of a Buddhist by culture or by conviction? She said, I guess I'd have to say I'm more by culture. I really don't follow the practices of Buddhism. I said, well, I don't know a whole lot about Buddhism, but I'd like to have a conversation with you if you're interested and, and, and tell you about how, uh, you know, Christianity, the, what, what Christianity is really all about. Not the cultural Christianity, but the convictional Christianity. So we had about a five-hour conversation. I went from Genesis through Concordance as best I could. I followed everything I could talk about from God and creation and Jesus Christ and the whole bit. Came all the way down. As we're starting to descend in the plane, she had come to a point, she says, I would like to place my faith in Jesus Christ and become a Christian. So she took me by the hands, and I didn't even prompt her. I asked her if she wanted me to. She said she didn't. I didn't even prompt her. She just prayed a, one of the most beautiful prayers of confession that I've ever heard of her giving her life to Jesus Christ. She's gotten connected with some missionary friends that I have in Chiang Mai and other places, and, and she's growing in Christ and involved in Christian work uh, in a Christian church where she lives. But just as I said amen, she's prayed a prayer, then I prayed for her, and we're still coming in for the landing. We, we, we uh, landed, and we're taxiing our way to the gate, and the guy that's sitting over here tapped me on the shoulder. And I didn't even know he spoke English. He had been talking German the whole trip when he, had, when he was in conversation. But he said in English, he said, I've been listening to what you've been talking about. Do you mind? Do you mind if I do what she just now did? And I thought to myself, shame on me. Shame on me for even thinking that I would want to be not in the middle seat 
when God already had a divine appointment already lined out that I just didn't know about. You see, God puts us in the middle. Here's Jesus Christ meeting needs. Here's a group of friends that have a paralytic friend that has a need to be met. God says, here you are, a group of friends. I'm putting you in the middle. I'm leaving you here because these people need him. So get yourself in the middle. Get yourself in the place and the position where you're supposed to be. And that's a choice you and I make. We can decide to ride the fence. We can decide to be on the sidelines. We can decide just to go through the routine. We can decide just to be cultural Christians. Or we can decide, I'm still on this earth because there are people in need that need Jesus. And I'm supposed to be a part of that. You see, he doesn't need us to do his evangelism plan. He could just go ahead and beam us on up. And he could just show up on a cloud every few years. And, and with CNN and Fox, they could be ready to shine their cameras at that cloud. And Jesus, I know, speaks West Texan. He would hold a lightning bolt in his hand and he would say with a loud voice, Y'all come or else. I'm sure there would be a pretty large invitation. And those who didn't, he could beam those on up that did. And then he could just show up again a few years later and do the same thing, do that for a few years, and then end it all. And we just keep all going to heaven. He leaves the church here because we are in the middle. He says, you're in the middle seat. Here are some people with a need. Here's the relationship that Jesus created everyone for. And you're the one to be trying to help them meet their need out of love. There's a second thing that I want you to get. I only have two points. Remember that. That second thing is when you're in the middle doing what you need to be doing, always be ready and willing to do the unexpected, unusual thing. Don't just go along with the crowd because it's the unexpected oftentimes that gets the greatest results and has the most lasting impact. Those men went up on top of the roof and tore it out. They did an unexpected thing in order to get their friend to Jesus. How many of us would do that unexpected thing? If we do the unexpected, it can have the, latest, the, the, the most lasting results. It was Joshua Chamberlain, a, a colonel in the, in the Union Army in the, in, during the Civil War, on July the 2nd of 1863, that made a decision that was very, very an unusual command that he gave to his 50th regiment of Maine. And because of that one decision, you and I are sitting here in a free country as Americans. I believe that it was the Gettysburg battle that, made the tri that turned the tide and changed, changed the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the tide of movement that... So far, the Confederacy was winning all the battles under Robert E. Lee. The Union Army for two years had not won any battles. They came to Gettysburg, and there was a three-mile line of Union Army. They started out at Culp Hill, and it kind of did a little hook, and it came along Seminary Ridge going south and came down to Big Round Top Hill and then Little Round Top Hill. Colonel Chamberlain had 300 of his men on, uh, of the 20th uh, Maine, and they were... They were to guard the flank at Little Round Top Hill. Here comes the Confederate. All they have to do is come around one of the flanks and they could take out the entire 50,000 soldiers of Union Army. And Robert E. Lee thought, I've been winning everything all along. I'm going to win this one. If the Battle of Gettysburg had fallen, I think the Union Army would have lost. I think that the United States would not be the United States. We would divide it up. Some historians say as many as 9 or 10 or 12 different countries. We wouldn't have been two countries, the North and the South. It would have been like Europe, a lot of different countries all across the continental United States. But because of that one battle on July the 2nd of 1863, that one decision that Colonel, that Colonel Chamberlain made, because he was told by his commanding officer, don't lose the flank. If they get around the flank, they just run right up through the north and come right over the hills and across the ridge, and we've lost the battle. You've got to hold the flank. Whatever you do, hold the flank. And so here comes the 15th and the 47th Regiment charging from Alabama, charging up the hill. Here's the 20th Maine Regiment with, under Colonel Chamberlain. They're holding the flank. And they fight back the Alabama regiments. They regroup down below. They charge again. Alabama comes, the Confederates come charging up. And the second time, the 20th Maine held them back. 
the 14th and the 47th uh, uh, Regiment of Alabama were supported by a Texas regiment. And here they come for a third charge. And then they were fought back. And then they come for a fourth charge. And they were fought back. And they knew at the top of the hill now the 300 soldiers of the, 40, uh, of, of the regiment from Maine were now from 300 down to about 70 or 75 soldiers. And they all came to Colonel Chamberlain and said, they're going to come back again. What are we going to do? He said, I want you to go to all these dead men and I want you to get all of their shells. We've got to get all the ammunition that we can get. And they said, we did that the last two times. We're out of shells. We can't fight them back a fifth time. And here they come again. And Colonel Chamberlain said, okay, men, fix bayonets. That one decision, an unusual decision, an unexpected decision, they all knew what fixed bayonets meant. It meant we're not going to stand here behind our makeshift barricades of wood and stone and keep firing down to hold the flank on top of this hill. We're going to jump over this. And he said, fix bayonets. He's about to call charge. And here comes the Alabama and part of the Texas regiment. They're charging that fifth time. And Colonel Chamberlain said, charge! It took 15, 20 minutes. They're charging down the hill. And in that 15 or 20 minutes, all of a sudden, these Confederates, they'd already charged four times and been beat back. But they were so surprised by this unexpected call by Colonel Chamberlain that they started dropping their guns and turning and running back down the hill and there were 300 POWs that the, that the main regiment were able to capture and they held the flank. And the Battle of Gettysburg was won by the Union Army two days later and it began the tide shift for the war to be won by the Union Army and here we stand today as free Americans in the United States of America because of that one decision of the unexpected. Let me ask you something. Are you willing to do the unexpected or you just want to sit back and say, you know, well, this is the way we've always done it. I'm willing just to settle for the routine. I don't really care about doing an unexpected thing for the cause of Christ. You and I are here to sit in the middle and to do something about bringing people to Christ. They've got needs. He's the needs meter. And you and I are here to do what is unexpected in doing that. Have you prayed for? Have you talked to? Have you done something for that friend of yours? Have you committed your life or are you just culturally Christian? I was traveling in London, or back to London from Birmingham, England a few years ago, sitting beside a young man. He knew I wasn't from Great Britain. I don't know, maybe it's because I said howdy to him. He said, what brings you to, to Great Britain? I said, well, I'm here working with a group of churches out of Birmingham. We've been talking about how, how they can organize themselves and be involved with the community of reaching out and meeting needs and bringing people to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I said, has anybody ever talked to you about how you can have a relationship with God in Jesus Christ? He said, oh, you don't want to talk to me about that. He said, he said I'm an atheist. And I said, you're not an atheist. I said, just like that. I don't recommend this to be a methodology you use, okay? I, I really don't recommend this. But I said, you're not an atheist. He said, what makes you think that? I, you don't even know me. And I said, well, because I read in a book one time. I didn't tell him it was the Bible. I said, I read in a book one time that only a fool says there is no God. And you look smarter than that to me. That's what I said. Don't use that as a method. It's not a good one. You'll probably be turned off pretty quickly. But I said... But I, said, I did it just that way. I said, you look smarter than that than me. I said, I, I think you're probably more like an agnostic. An atheist says there is no God. An agnostic said, I just don't know if there is one. I think you're an agnostic more than you're an atheist. You just think you're an atheist. I said, but would you like to have a conversation for the three hours that we still have remaining on this train? Would you like to have a conversation of how you can know there is a God whose name is Jesus Christ? We got into that conversation. We're moving ourselves on the train, going down toward Paddington Station in London. I, I, again, go through Genesis, through Concordance. I do the best I can. He got off the train. He didn't become a Christian. I gave him a business card. I said, here's my email. Here's my phone number. I said, I want to give you a New Testament, and I want you to start right here in, Matthew, in Mark. Just start reading in Mark. I thought it would be easier to read in Mark because it's real kind of quick, and it tells me a lot of stories, but it's better than trying to explain begats. You know, I don't even know how to pronounce the name. So I said, start in Mark. Just read through the Gospel of Mark. If you ever have a question about anything you're reading, then just email me and I'll answer it. A few months later, about a year went by almost, eight to ten months. 
He sent me an email. I get this email. By the, by the way, his name is Michael Jackson. When he sent me an email about eight or ten months later, I get this email from Michael Jackson. This is about three weeks after Michael Jackson, that we all know, died. I get an email from Michael Jackson. I'd forgotten about London and Michael Jackson. I mean, he's alive. <laughs> Why is he writing me? <laughs> so I get this, I open it up, and I find out this this guy. Oh, yeah, that's that, that's that guy from Great Britain. He says, I'm reading in the Gospel of Mark, or I'm reading in Mark, and he said, I have this question. I answered it. We started an ongoing email conversation. He went from Mark over to uh, Luke and John and Acts, and, and he kept asking questions. He was in Galatians. I said, he's reading all the way through the New Testament. He got into 1 John, 2 John, asked some questions. I'd answer them. We carried this on for about a year and a half. Got down to Revelation, sent me, a, sent me an email, and I said, get out of Revelation. Go back to Matthew. I'd rather deal with the begats, you know. I don't know how to deal with that other stuff. <laughs> Make a long story short, he became a Christian. Today, he is a church planter starting a new church uh, up in the north, northeastern part of England. There's a pastor of an evangelical church named Michael Jackson, because there was a time when we could do the unexpected in the middle. How about you? There may be some of you that are here today and say, you know, I don't find myself in the middle. I'm not even a believer in Christ. I'm not a follower of his. I, I, I've been going through the routine. I'm a good churchman or woman. I go through the routine, but I've never placed my faith in Christ. Or there may be some of the others of you say, I've placed my faith in Christ, but you know what? I'm following just culturally. I'm really not convicted or committed the way that I know I should be. I'm really not fulfilling why God's even left me here on this earth as the church. i just kind of going through the routine, and someday I can go home. I don't know what decision God may have for you, but you know because God's been talking to you, and so in just a moment I'm going to have... I'm going to have you to stand up, and I want to have you to make a commitment in a public way or a personal way. Brother Jim's going to be standing here at the front. Brother Truman's here. There are other staff. Or if you'd like to just kind of hang around after we dismiss in a few moments and go ahead and talk to someone about how you can be a deeper follower of the Christ, maybe for the very first time, maybe in a recommitment, maybe as a church member to this church. But whatever it is, don't leave today until you do business with God. Let's all stand together. Father God, we're thankful for the privilege you've given to us. We're thankful that we can join together in this place today and that we can come before you in your presence. And we're thankful that you call us to decision. God, I pray that we would have the courage, the sensitivity, and the wisdom to make the decision you call us to make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.